this topic uh, is has been coming up quite a bit in our coaching sessions with our clients. And, uh, you know, this feeling of, well, you know, the pandemic is slowly coming to an end. We can see light at the end of the tunnel, but why are we feeling really unmotivated? We know, but as leaders, uh, you have to set the, the tone and the stage for, for your teams. And yet you're probably experiencing um, burnout and uh, some frustration as well. So I uh, have the good fortune of meeting Lindsay, who's here with us today as our speaker. And she is CEO of Mental Health in Minutes. And her company is very interesting because um, she's created this, this incredible platform to, and develop content for organizations and for leaders to be able to open up discussions about mental health, to actually put in some programming, whether it's uh, you know at the beginning of a meeting or if you want to dedicate lunch, uh, dedicate lunch and learn. So it's not to, for, for individual employees to access that content directly, but it's to be able to equip leaders and organizations with content and open up those discussions and uh, help your team start to engage in uh, conversations around mental health. So uh, Lindsay is a certified psychological health and safety advisor, and uh, she is she works with positive psychology, um, teaches self-awareness, and she brings in a lot of brain science. So I know there's some uh, really brilliant technical minds here in this group today. So uh, she's going to be talking about some of the science. And um, so what I do is I also looked up positive psychology. And some of you may remember the term um, appreciative inquiry. You know, that was looking at things from a positive perspective and um, what's working well and what to keep, you know, improving versus looking at things from an illness perspective or what's wrong that needs to be fixed. So positive psychology is also similar in that way. So it's different than traditional psychology where it was about, um, what did I write down here? Uh, decreasing well, uh, or how to uh, increase wellness by decreasing the bad stuff. And Lindsay's gonna, she's much more um, articulate than I am about this. But I, when I looked it up, it said, it's the science and study of what makes life worth living. And there was three things that positive psychology focuses on, or there is. Uh, one is a positive experience, like happiness, joy, inspiration. Another one is positive states and traits like gratitude, resilience, and compassion. And then focusing on institutions and applying positive principles within an entire organization and institution. And that's why we are holding this discussion today with all of you leaders um, to be able to think about um, the influence that you have and the, the assistance you're likely going to be needing to not only give to yourself and, and your own self-care, but also to your teams as they're coming back uh, to work um, after the pandemic. And so there's a whole range of feelings and, and some of it is guilt. We're hearing about guilt where people are saying, okay, this is over now. Now I can go on a holiday with my family. Why am I not feeling motivated? Why am I feeling really lethargic? Why is it that my brain can't focus as well as it did before? And I'm, you know, you may have experienced some of those things too. So uh, thank you, Lindsay, for being here to help us uh, learn more and uh, just to think about how we can apply some of the practical tips that you're going to be sharing with us. Awesome. Thank you very much. Now, don't get, don't get distracted by those questions and, you know, get a preview. We got to do the thing first. I really appreciate the opportunity to be hanging out with uh, all of you fine folks. It is my pleasure to talk to you about one of my absolute favorite topics, um, burnout and hope. These are two topics that I usually speak about independently and we're jamming them together because they fit so nicely um, when you kind of move from that hopelessness of overwhelm and, and too much stress and all of the things from burnout and you can move to the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Rochelle had mentioned that, you know, COVID is coming to an end. We can make shadow puppets in the light at the end of that tunnel now. We are getting so close to it, I feel like. and. Um, this hopefully the information that you take away from today will give you some some lessons some strategies some discussion points to take away and uh, use with your people as they come back into the office as well so a little bit about what is going to happen in the next come on baby mm, please hold as i try to advance my slides why why? There we go. Here's what's going to happen in the next 25-ish minutes. Uh, we're going to talk about how burnout is different from stress, because um, they are two completely different things. 
We're going to talk about the 13 warning signs to look for in yourself and in your colleagues, your friends, your family um, to see when they are uh, possibly sliding into burnout. And then I'm going to tell you about the science of hope and how you can use hope to, uh, to stop that slide into burnout. And then we're going to talk about some proactive action that you can take um, to, to continue to move you towards a future better than today. Anybody have any questions? Please feel free to speak up. Um, I, I think that Rochelle would like you to uh, make comments if you would in the chat or you can, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you can also come off of mute and speak as much as you'd like. All right, I'm just moving my, your beautiful pictures around. All right. So uh, today's talk about burnout is very, very personal to me. And it's the very reason that I got into this work. I didn't realize I'd lost my hope till the day I recognized that I got it back. It was one of those totally innocuous moments. I was driving along, minding my own business. When I experienced that proverbial ta-da moment, I sat up a little straighter. And then I kind of slunk down again. You know, those feelings of confidence, fright, realization, and sadness washed over me in cycles. I mean, I like to think I'm a pretty self-aware person, but how on earth did I not realize that I was feeling hopeless in my life? that my life had lost that positive expectation for the future. To this point, I was feeling fine, you know, status quo. At the time, I was consulting a lot. <laughs> I was working as an operations manager for another small business entrepreneur, and I was helping the company I consulted through to build out a new service area in their business. But what I'd realized that although I was still accomplishing and achieving at work, I was kind of holding it together at home. My thoughts of the future, my drive and ambition to accomplish my dreams had faded into the background. It's lost, it had lost all its allure. For the past four years, my husband and I have been recovering from mental health and addiction at home. A journey that's taught us a lot about brain science, the difference between stress and burnout, and how to cope and thrive when nothing seems logical or stable. It was this aha moment where I realized what an impact our journey had on me as a person, as a wife, and the science of hope is what I used to get my hope back. One of the awesome things about this new awareness was that I could take control of my burnout and reverse the slide by taking control of the things I could control. I didn't have to live like I was on fire. I could take action and move towards a future better than today. I'd like to talk more about that, starting with our own levels of burnout. And what is burnout? Burnout is described by the World Health Organization as a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. It is when you feel like, when you move from feeling like it's all too much, too much stress, too much to do, too much distraction, too much all the things, and when you cross over into feeling like you don't have enough, not enough time, energy, truly not enough cares left to give. It's often characterized by three dimensions, feelings of energy depletion and exhaustion, a, dec a decreased mental distance from one's job or an increased mental distance from one's job. So feeling like you're disconnected, disengaged from your job, or maybe you're feeling negative or have some cynicism related to your job that didn't exist before. And often this also leads to reduced professional efficacy. So you aren't as productive or as as efficient or effective as you used to be in your job. I feel like uh, the WHO started their definition of burnout at work, but I think we can all agree that uh, with how closely tied work and life are together, that burnout can be applied in all areas of our life, not just at work. Burnout results from stressors. So the things that activate the stress response in our body. Stress is actual, actually a chemical response in our body. When the stressors, external, like work or money or kids, or internal stressors, like shame, perfectionism, uh, my personal favorite, people pleasing, when these stressors are present in our lives, it activates our stress response, our sympathetic nervous system, which, is, which raises those stress chemicals in our body to dangerous levels, if left for too long. And those dangerous levels for too long, prolonged stress 
is what causes burnout, that state of physical and emotional exhaustion. Stress is okay in short bursts for small periods of time. It's that prolonged, that maintaining those high levels of stress over the long term. And we're talking two weeks or more. Long term is not years and years and years. Obviously, the longer, the worse it is for your body. But stress is actually the physical response, the mental response in your body. It's not just something that we should have to live with. Because unchecked, that is what leads to burnout long term. So how do you know if you're heading into burnout? Here are 13 warning signs for you to pay attention to within yourself and also within your friends and family and colleagues. Number one, having a negative attitude or a critical attitude at work is a sign that you could be heading for burnout. If you're dreading going into work and once you're there, you wanna pick up and go home. <laughs> that is a sign that you could be heading for burnout. If you have low energy or little interest in doing your work, this is a sign you could be heading for burnout. If you're having trouble sleeping, if you're uh, having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep once you're there, this is a physical sign that you could be heading for burnout. If you're finding that you're absent from work a lot or similarly presenteeism, if you're there in body but not necessarily in mind or spirit, this is a sign that you could be heading for burnout. If you've been having feelings of emptiness where that didn't exist for you before, this is a sign that you could be heading for burnout. If you're having physical complaints where there wasn't any before, headaches, unexplained illnesses, pain in your stomach, this is a sign that your chemicals in your, your stress chemicals in your body are elevated and you could be heading for burnout. 45 year old friend of mine spent eight hours in the hospital on Friday with what has now been diagnosed as burnout. And he just thought he was having a heart attack. If you are irritated easily, or if your patient seems to be a bit thinner than normal, or then it has, you, then you sort of pride yourself on, on having, this is a sign that you could be heading for burnout. All team members or just some team, just some <laughs> team members? More than normal, more oh, than okay. you usually would. <laughs> Possibly your kids. I find when I yell at the dogs, that's the sign uh, for me to dial back on some of the stress. Um, if you're having thoughts that your work doesn't have meaning or that you aren't making a difference any longer, this is a sign you could be heading for burnout. If you feel yourself pulling away emotionally from your clients or your colleagues, if you are, you know, choosing not to engage in social interaction where you used to be for, this is a, this is the classic sign of, uh, heading for burnout. We are, as humans, um, we tend to go internal when things are, um, unmanageable or, or, you know, super overwhelming um, externally. If you feel like your work and your contribution is going unrecognized, that you aren't, that nobody recognizes the value that you're putting in, this is a sign that you could be heading for burnout, especially if that's a stark difference from how you usually feel at work. If you find yourself blaming other people for your mistakes and that's not your normal default, uh, this could be a sign that you're heading for burnout. And last and certainly not least, if you're thinking of quitting work or changing roles, this is a sign that you could be heading for burnout. I'd love to know if this is resonating with anyone, if anyone would care to share. If anything here was surprising or they thought that it was normal, which it, of course it's normal, but it doesn't have to be that way. I know number 10 for me was the looking back, my deepest, darkest moments. Number 10 was the one that showed up for me the loudest that I didn't realize. Lindsay, just have a quick question for you. Yeah. 
So, you know, each of these in isolation, you know, there are times where we're irritated or there are times where, uh, we, you know, we're having trouble sleeping. Is there a certain um, um, ratio of or, or balance of some of these together that uh, would mean that you're closer to burnout than just one thing individually? Yeah, definitely. Um, it ebbs and flows, right? Stress, stresses are in our lives and then they can can reduce. It's that prolonged period of time. If you kind of look back over the last two weeks, a month, and many of these or, or a, a lot of these are still are showing up for you consistently, that's a good sign. If you notice, yeah, yeah you know what, that showed up once three weeks ago and hasn't really been a problem since, um, that is probably just you had a high stress environment, you know, large stressors that sent your sympathetic nervous system into overdrive, but you've managed to do something to interrupt that um, negative stress chemical and kicked your parasympathetic nervous system back uh, into regulation, which is uh, just from a quick science point of view, the sympathetic nervous system is what's responsible for your fight, flight, or freeze. And if you can interrupt that with your, your parasympathetic nervous system will kick in and bring you back into regulation. So it is, it, it's that prolonged over time, more, most often when you're feeling these kinds of things, um, if they're one off or last for a short period of time, you could just have high stress in that moment, in that season, and then sort of come back down to regulation. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. So if you recognize any of these in yourself or in your colleagues, in your family and friends, what can you do about it? The good news is that burnout is totally reversible. You can do some things to close that stress cycle, to engage your uh, parasympathetic nervous system. And one of the things that works best for me is the science of hope. The biggest way to stop the slide into burnout is to find your hope. The Science of Hope is a sub-science within the discipline of positive psychology, which Rochelle mentioned. Uh, positive psychology was founded in the 1980s by a scientist called Dr. Martin Seligman. It was his legacy that he wanted to leave uh, when he was the president of the American Psych Psychology Association uh, back in 1989. And to this point, the scientific community was focused on decreasing our levels of sadness, focused on solutions to depression, anxiety, other diagnosable mental illness. But Dr. Seligman wanted to discover if, instead of focusing on decreasing sadness, could we focus on increasing happiness and life satisfaction? You know, instead of starting at the negative and moving to neutral, could we start at neutral and go up from there? And as the research progressed, a protege of Dr. Seligman emerged, a gentleman called Dr. Rick Snyder, who wanted to focus more specifically on hope and the impact that future positive thought had on our brain patterns. He is, Dr. Rick Snyder is a bit of a uh, unknown mentor to me. I have read all of his things and I learned everything that he, uh, that he published before his uh, early death. Um, but we'll spend the next few minutes talking about the science of hope and the work that Dr. Snyder has done. But before I tell you how your brain works on hope, I'd like to help you bottle your hope so you can reach for it anytime you need to. Because Absolutely, we can uh, change our neural pathways and create visions for the future that we can pick up and draw on anytime that we're feeling not so hopeful. So to do this, we're going to create the start of your bucket list. I'd like you to grab a pen and paper or your computer or your phone or something that you have there. And I'd like you to write down two or three things that might be on your bucket list. I'd like you to write down two or three things that you'd like to be see, do, or have. These are big sky, no limits, no boundaries kind of dreams. Think about large audacious things. Don't think about limits or restrictions due to finances or circumstances or COVID. I would like you to be specific when writing down, when writing these goals down, these bucket list dreams, because I want you to know what accomplishment or achievement looks like but I don't want you to put any time boundaries around them. So make sure that they're specific enough that you know what it looks like when you succeed, 
but don't put any time, uh, don't make them time bound. We're not interested right now in talking about when you're going to accomplish these things, just that they're something that you would like to. Think big and let yourself be audacious. I'm going to give you a few minutes. 226, we'll come back at 228. So give some, write down those dreams. I'm not going to ask you to share them so they can be as private or personal as you'd like them to be. But dream big, see how big you can dream. It's hard. Within my consulting practice, I have an exper experience called Bucket List Builder, where I ask you to do a hundred of these. And it's awful and awesome. <laughs> because then we go, we set out and accomplish them, which is the awesome part. But it's hard. It's hard to think big, right? We usually put limits on ourselves when we're dreaming. Anybody need a little more time? All right, feel free to keep writing, but I hope that you've written at least one because, excuse me, I would like you to pick your favorite one and we're gonna do a little thought experiment. I would like you to imagine yourself achieving this goal, reaching this dream. What would that look like? What would it feel like or smell like? Who would you tell? How would you celebrate? Who might be with you? What new op opportunities would accomplish of this goal lead to? Would like you to make this image as vivid as possible. Think about all of your senses. Think about what you might wear, where you might be. I'd like you to hold on to that feeling, that vision. And obviously I have no way of knowing what vision you imagined. But I do know that you drew on your past experiences to create this future vision. You compared and combined pieces of your past to create something better. You probably pictured likable people around you. You may have thought about the resources that would make this experience even better, like more money, more freedom, maybe a greater sense of meaning. You no doubt felt positive emotions when you imagined yourself accomplishing this goal, maybe pride or excitement, maybe serenity or joy or a feeling of security. These emotions are not just a feel good byproduct of your imagination. They're actually a cognitive guide that leads you to invest in certain lines of thought. And it also helps you to avoid others. These hopeful feelings begin to arouse the motivation you'll need to make these dreams a reality. And it's these positive emotions that we're gonna bottle. You've created this vision. Now I want you to imagine taking those emotions and mentally putting them into a bottle in your mind. And then put that stopper on tight. You don't want the hope to escape till you're ready to take the lid off next time. Put that bottle onto a shelf in your mind and leave it there for safekeeping. And then the next time you're feeling down or afraid, you can go back into your memory bank and pull that bottle off the shelf. Everybody got that stopper on the bottle and on the shelf? Okay, that's your hope, you're gonna hold on to it especially as you go into the next few days or weeks or months um, as we re-emerge into what our new normal looks like. That's your brain on hope. You're making all of these visions in your limbic system, which is what I like to call the hope circuit, where your mind will, make, will keep it safe until you need it. You can reimagine that hopeful vision and know that you have the power and energy to keep moving towards that hopeful future. In super simple terms, the limbic system of the brain is how our mind uses hope to motivate action. Something I learned about all within the science of hope. So I told you about Rick Snyder, excuse me, and how he was focused on hope specifically. He's the one that introduced me to the hope circuit. 
It starts with the hippocampus. This is the part of the brain designed for memory and long-term success. It's in the hippocampus that our brains store important moments as memory, allowing us to recall it later. And it's also where we store, store all of our learning, our experiences, and our emotional responses. It might help you to remember the hippocampus like an elephant with its trunk all curled up. This is kind of the shape of the hippocampus in your brain. It's also because the elephant never forgets. And next comes the amygdala, which we imagine as the guard dog. And this is what triggers our reactions to emotions from the hippocampus. So when you created that future vision, and then I asked you to imagine what it looked like and felt like and smelt like, that was happening in your amygdala. It's the guard dog, the amygdala, that spurs us to act when we feel threatened and triggers us to act on the feelings that drive and energize vision. The amygdala is also the part of the brain that helps us let go, get, let go of goals that don't matter anymore or aren't in our best interests. And it helps to push us to make smarter choices. This area of the brain is also responsible for curiosity, which can get us into trouble if we're prone to distraction. I like to call this my shiny squirrel syndrome. The final area of the brain involved in the science of hope is the prefrontal cortex, the PFC. This part of the brain can be compared to a wise old owl, which helps us coordinate and rationalize all the memories, thoughts, and feelings going around in the system. The PFC functions as the brain's control center, which is responsible for learning, organizing, and helping us to sort out our feelings. It's the part of the brain that lights up when students are asked to think about the courses they need to graduate when you leaders are asked to develop and execute on a vision for your company, and when you created your bucket list. In my opinion, the PFC is the most important aspect of this system because it reinforces the importance of hope. Everyone's definition of hope is different. Through this work, I've come up with my own definition, which is that the future will be better than today by taking action over the things we can control. The key words in there, for me, our future, action, and control. If you're feeling overwhelmed, burnt out, like you just have no more cares left to give, you can take action over the things you can control and your future will be better than today. And here are a few ideas where you can take proactive action to create a future better than today. Because in the same way that we all have physical health, we all have mental health. Your mental health is every bit as important as your physical health. And in fact, dare I say, I think your mental health is more important than your physical health. The same way that a regular maintenance program that includes daily brushing and flossing contributes to great dental health, maintaining active participation in our mental health leads to better human health. Being proactive about your mental health maintenance leads to personal and professional well being increased engagement both professionally and personally, and lets you to be more clear-headed and participate, participatory in your goals and dreams. A few of these might not be as obvious to you. The whole get enough sleep one, <laughs> this one takes discipline, right? There's always something else to be doing, I feel like. You know, if we could think about our kids or when we were kids and we didn't want a nap and now all we want is a nap, <laughs> Quality sleep is key to quality living. Turn off the Netflix and charge your phone across the room where you can't check it as often. Find some time to charge and to charge your mental and your physical batteries. One of the ones that I really love here is spending time in nature. Being outdoors revives the soul in ways that cannot be understood. There's lots of science and research going on around this right now and how, you know, the oxygen that the trees put off and just being in nature, how that actually increases our mental wellness. But there's still so much about it that's misunderstood, but we know it's so good. You don't have to climb a mountain or ride a wave. Just go for a walk around your neighborhood. You can think about how you felt before you went and how you felt afterwards. And I almost guarantee you that and it, you will feel an improvement in your wellness after you've spent time in nature. There's something to be said for listening to your insta instincts. That whole gut mind connection cannot be underestimated either. It's funny how much we already know 
that we don't know we already know, right? Your gut will tell you a lot before your mind figures it out. And we're wired with certain instincts. So if you listen and don't get shiny squirrel syndrome, like I do, if we listen to what our intuition is telling us, it's often right before we even know that it's right. There's so many things that we can do to be proactive about our mental health. These are just a few of them. I'm sure you can think of a few more. The last tip I wanna leave you with today is that hope is contagious. If you're feeling particularly hopeful today, model that behavior out loud. Maybe someone else needs to see it to be inspired by you. We don't know what people are going through. We don't know what's going on inside their heads. So if you have hope to spare, share it. Talk about your goals, your plans, your progress. Share your why, your passion, your excitement for the future. And definitely share how you've identified pathways towards your goals, how you've overcome barriers and stretched your hope muscle. We are inspired by others we see modeling behavior we'd like to emulate. Share your hope when you have some extra and borrow hope when you need it. Hope is a big motivator for me. The promise of a future better than today is what keeps me trying the next right thing. We talked about burnout and how it's not just too much stress in our lives, but it's actually the chemical response in our bodies to the prolonged existence of stressors. We talked about how to identify signs of burnout in ourselves and others. And we talked about the signs of hope and how setting goals and generating hope and happiness can actually change the way our neurons fire, lighting us up from the inside. It's been my pleasure to share hope and the science or burnout and the science of hope with you today. Thank you.